Hello. Um, very briefly, uh, a picture of my context. Um, Hodgehill is in East Birmingham, just under the M6, uh, where it still runs along concrete pillars from Spaghetti Junction. Um, in 2001, our demographic breakdown looked a bit like that. In 2011, it looked like that. So quite dramatic demographic change over the last 10 years, uh, with the largest new and growing group being Pakistani Mirpuri Muslim. Um, that's our parish of about 21,000 people. Uh, you can see the straight line of the M6 bordering it at the top. There's a river at the bottom, uh, uh, the outer ring road of Birmingham on the left hand side and the, the city boundary with Solihull on the right hand side. So it's quite a well defined patch. And that's the Furs and Brumford estate, uh, a 1950s and 60s outer estate, traditionally white working class uh, but now increasingly diverse. The red and orange shows you the indices of multiple deprivation in the top 5% in the country, uh, the red being in the top 2%. Uh, the green patch is in the, in the better 50% uh, in the country, but that's obviously not the whole story. I find the Church Urban Fund's Web of Poverty a really helpful way of expanding those basic um, statistics understanding poverty not only in terms of resources but also in terms of relationships and crucially for my story this morning in terms of identity. The Furs and Bromford is a place where people over decades have been done to, let down, overlooked, stigmatised. It is the kind of place that politicians are fond of referring to as broken ghettos, as work shy estates and if you believe the Daily Mail, which I hope you don't, um, we rank as the top seven, seven out of ten on the benefit black spots list in the country and we're very proud of it. <laughs> <coughs> I want to chart over a few minutes a story of a number of moments of, of our journey in Hodgehill over the last few years and a sense of, of where we've found ourselves being increasingly politicised in the process. So moment number one is a shift from being a centre of community to being a treasure seeker. That is the 1960s pioneering cutting edge multi-purpose building that was St Philip and St James Hodge Hill, uh, lauded by Stephen Lowe in uh, What Makes a Good City um, and demolished about six years ago. There is a 1960s Ecclesiastical Architecture Preservation Society, believe it or not, and they were trying to get it listed, so the Archdeacon sent the bulldozers in. <laughs> and so I arrived about five years ago in a place that was in mourning. It was the hub of community. It was the place where people came and do, did stuff. It hosted groups and activities every night of the week in all kinds of different venues throughout the building. And folks said to me, we have no idea why you've wanted to come to Hodgehill, we haven't even got a building. And I'd smile and, and twinkle my eye back to them. Um, but we together sat down and mapped the area and worked out what kind of parish we were. We gathered the statistics, we placed on the map those places where people bump into each other in the local neighbourhood and then we went out to those places and we listened. Often we joined conversations that were already in flow about what was good and what was not good about our neighbourhoods, about what our hopes and dreams and what the challenges were for the neighbourhood. And sometimes we found ourselves hearing those conversations into speech creating spaces where people could artic articulate for the first time something that they were sensing about what was, what was changing in their locality. And out of those conversations we decided we wanted to celebrate the stories that we heard. And by one 
means or another, including me standing in the local post office and saying, nobody moves until you nominate some people. We picked up 97 nominees for unsung heroes in our local neighbourhood. People who demonstrated compassion, generosity, trust, friendship and hope. And we brought them together and we celebrated them and told their stories and we invited them to say, if they could find a couple of other people to join them, what would they start in their neighbourhood? And one of the things that one person said was that they were passionate about drama and they wanted to start a theatre group. And we were able to help Phil start the Brumford Theatre Group just with a little tiny bit of money and a bit of connecting and a little bit of know-how around uh, finding people who could sew costumes and other people who can make props. And it began. And in the process of those kind of stories, we discovered that we had found a role connecting together different assets within a neighbourhood. The school's knowledge and passion of local residents, the power of local associations, not the kind with constitutions and agendas, but those little networks of people like dog walkers and mums at the school gate. The resources of local institutions, the resources and the economies of the place itself, and the stories of local people. And we found that we were not really deliberately at this point telling a different story about our neighbourhood. A story not of deprivation and of lack and of problems, but a story of what was good. The treasures that were hidden in our neighbourhood, in our community. And one of the things that came out of the Brumford Theatre Group was a passion play. It was their idea rather than ours as a church. And under the concrete pillars of the M6, on a very cold and snowy Good Friday, we crucified Jesus. And the song that accompanied the crucifixion was Ben Harper's arrangement of Maya Angelou's words. Now did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders fallen down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my confidence upset you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I walk like I've got a diamond mine breaking up in my front yard. Some of you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes. And I'll rise, I'll rise, I'll rise. A statement of defiance, of passionate hope against the odds and against the dominant narrative. So that's moment number one. Moment number two is discovering in ourselves a shift from being service provider to threshold maker. A few years back some folk from the congregation came back from spring harvest and said we've been talking to the folk from CAP and we want to start a debt centre. And we just paused for a little while, in fact we paused for about a year, to try and work out whether that was the right thing to do locally. There was obviously a need there, but, but was that the right response to the need? And we didn't start a cap debt centre, we started Open Door. And the philosophy of Open Door was, yes, to meet people as they came presenting with needs, but to invite them through the door to discover that they had gifts of the heart, of the head and of the hand, things that they were passionate about, things that they knew about things that they could do to help out their neighbours, often in quite small ways. And we found ourselves shaping Birmingham's network of what have now become places of welcome. Places that are hospitable and accessible. Places with people who are welcoming and inclusive. Places where presence, listening, Treating people as human beings is at the core. Places, yes, where there might be provision, but that provision might be as simple as a cup of tea and some toast. And places that invite people into participation, to use their talents and skills and experience to participate in relationships. 
And we discovered with time that what we thought we were doing and what certain statutory agencies thought we were doing were quite different. The job centre would refer people to us because they thought we were getting people jobs. And sometimes we did. But in fact, what we thought we were doing was not about getting people onto the treadmill of employment, but getting people to meet their neighbours and to participate in community activities. The job centre thought we were handing out food parcels, and yes, we did a bit of that. But what we thought we were doing was getting people around tables, eating and cooking together. We discovered that we were an interface between what the system does and talks about and how the system treats people and a different world that tried to treat people differently and invite them into a different kind of economy. An economy based around our community lunch each week where people come and bring and share food together and eat together and make friends. The third moment is in what I'm calling the move from just doing it to irritating wider. I found myself involved in uh, a big city social inclusion process. I won't name any names uh, to avoid incrimination. Um, and a group of the social inclusion process people came out to visit us on the Furs and Bromford and they had 20 minutes to meet with us and they wanted to know what the problems were here. And they asked us if we had a magic wand, uh, what, would, what would be different as a result? And we told them that we didn't want to talk about the problems and we told them that there weren't any magic wands and invited them to get real. Um, <laughs> And they went away and maybe it was something they heard from us or maybe it was something they heard from others in the process. Um, but they shaped a document which talked about a new way of working that was about asset-based working. Um, and, and maybe because I'd been saying something similar in Hodgehill, I was invited to uh, facilitate a workshop at one of the social inclusion summits. Um, and... It was a bit last minute and I said, well, I'll facilitate the workshop, but uh, if you want to do some case studies, can you do the case studies and I'll, I'll just kind of help people work their way through them. And I was sent a case study uh, that was very clearly in an asset-based approach to working. Jacob, an eight-year-old boy, threatened a young boy at school with a knife. Jacob is from a family who recently moved into the area and very little is known about them. Jacob has an older brother, Peter, who is 13 years old and has learning difficulties. It was later established that there were high levels of domestic abuse within the family home involving Jacob's mother, with his stepfather being the perpetrator. The mother is unemployed and has mental health issues. She's been in and out of hospital, frequently found drunk. The family is in rent arrears and could face eviction. How would you support this family? I have to say, trying to take an asset-based approach with that case study uh, was more than a challenge. Um, and the conclusion from the very worthy group of professionals in the statutory and voluntary sector that were part of, of the workshop that I was involved in was that we needed to get a CAF conference together. And I found myself increasingly frustrated to the point that at the end of the summit, um, when I was invited to feedback, I felt like I needed to name the addiction that was going on in the room. It was an addiction to what we might call service provision. And in more theological language, uh, from Bishop John Taylor in The Christ Like God, who reflects on the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, it was an addiction to the power of the provider, of being able to do something for other people and feel good in the process. It was an addiction to the power of the possessor, who controls what is going on because it's our project. It was an addiction to the power of the performer, who does stuff and other people look at us and see that it is good and that makes us feel better and maybe more people will come through our doors. Um, they didn't like that very much. <laughs> and because that was in a Lent leading up to a Maundy Thursday a few years back, I also mentioned the story of Jesus washing Peter's feet. 
The point of the story is not that we should go and wash other people's feet, or, although not, not to begin with at least. The point of the story is that we need to learn to receive the foot washing from others. The other moment in this section was when I was invited to speak at the launch of a food bank and a community action network and uh, the person who invited me is in the room so I won't be, certainly won't be rude about that. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to encourage people who are involved in that food bank to get angry, to not enjoy that power of being the provider but to ask the questions about what kind of sticking plaster it was uh, and what was the wound underneath the sticking plaster. Um, but thankfully or, or delightfully or, or slightly mischievously, the, the mayor of uh, another region just round the corner from the big city that I inhabit uh, was on first and he wanted to thank everybody present for helping out the council in difficult times. Um, which meant that I was given a golden opportunity to suggest to him that we needed to ask three questions and we needed to get the order right. Firstly, what can we do with neighbourhood power? Secondly, what do we need some external support with? And thirdly, what do we need external agencies to do? And I suggested gently to the Mayor that councils often get the order completely the wrong way around. They start with the last question, what do we need to do as the council? And then, if they have a bit of space and time left over, they ask, What's, what can communities do for themselves? In Hodgshill, we have chosen quite deliberately, and for a number of reasons I won't go into, not to become a member of Citizens UK in Birmingham, but to join with other institutions in Birmingham in a more ad hoc basis when the issue seems to resonate with the issues that seem to resonate locally. The main reason is because we feel the need to start with the local, to start with building local relationships, the micro stuff, and to hear local people into speech, not just to try and hear from them the answers that we expect to hear already. Some words from Nell Morton. Hearing to speech is political. Hearing to speech is never one-sided. Once a person is heard to speech, she becomes a hearing person. Speaking first to be heard is power over. Hearing to bring forth speech is empowering. We're trying to create spaces, environments, where people can say things that they've never said before. Where the things that are most difficult to ex express and articulate can be heard. Some of those things can be out of great fragility. Some of those things can be out of frustration and anger. And in the process we've discovered places where we can feed upwards into the institution that is the church. At, on at least one occasion I've noticed an archbishop quoting me, although he didn't attribute it. Um, <laughs> before I mention social media, there's something, I think, certainly in the Church of England, and I can't speak for any other churches at the moment, um, there's an anxiety around about institutional survival that seems to be driven by a kind of capitalist, consumerist model of church growth. Um, I would suggest that what we're learning, learning locally is a challenge to that model of what church looks like. Um, and an invitation into a different kind of ecclesiology. Um, but I won't say any more about that. Um, I find myself wondering, as someone who blogs occasionally and who uses Twitter quite a lot, whether, whether that kind of poetics, that kind of telling the stories locally and connecting with other people for whom that resonates and who have similar stories to tell. I wonder whether there's some power in that or whether we're just deluding ourselves and, and talking to each other. Um, and I want to finish with what I'm suggesting is, is 
a final moment that maybe we're beginning to inhabit that feels a bit apocalyptic. It feels to me, and partly because I'm a natural pessimist, um, that there's a fair amount of bad news ahead. Um, I wonder if whichever party gets in UK politics is heading further right, where corporate business interests seem to dominate, and for everyone else there's more austerity, more poverty, more stigmatising, more divisiveness. It certainly seems clear that sometime soon the petrol's going to run out, and that transport of food, of goods, of people is going to get more and more expensive. And certainly as far as the Church of England is concerned, and again I can't speak for any other denominations or faith communities, but uh, the institutional church looks like it's a few years away from imploding. Money, people and buildings uh, becoming more and more difficult to sustain. Um, Against that apocalyptic backdrop, I think what we're learning in Hodge Hill is that the future is local. Within that, we're trying little ways of localising the way we grow our food, the way we generate our energy, the way exchanges and economies happen, often without money, and more of that later, I'm sure. We're trying to practice a radical hospitality which values and listens to and welcomes people that society as a whole is saying are not valuable or worth listening to or shouldn't be welcomed. And we're trying to find little ways of generating a local public square where people can argue about stuff and dig into the issues and explore the big picture and imagine how things could be different. And within that, we're discovering new ways of being church, if that's not a cliché that should be avoided. We're wondering whether, in little and modest and very fragile and fallible ways, we might be trying to prefigure a different kind of world. I found myself reading anarchists and post-anarchists quite a lot recently, and wonder if in a strange white middle class Church of England kind of way we might be doing a bit of anarchy locally in that we value and emphasise direct relationships of care in that we try and make life as horizontal and associational as possible rather than hierarchical and institutional and in that we're trying to create common spaces and common wealth within our locality It's unavoidably messy, and there's a sense of urgency about it, I think, because of that apocalyptic backdrop, but we're discovering that it can only ever, ever happen slowly, and so we're learning an urgent slowness, if that's not a contradiction in terms. That's me done, I think.